So the spatial resolution of MRI is defined by crudely the field of view that you're looking at. So you define that field of view by the gradient strength that you're, that you're interested in. So you can make small field of view and large field of views. Um, the larger the field of view that, um, and the number of pixels that you have in each dimension essentially define, I mean, the field of view, the spatial resolution truly is defined by um, the edge of the edge of K space, which we won't really talk about here, um, but is essentially a temporal space that allows you to do, uh, or a frequency space that allows you to then translate that to a spatial spatial information. That all being said, the spatial resolution of an MRI is crudely defined as the the field of view that you're looking at cut up to the, into the number of pixels in each dimension. So. Because everything is binary, you normally do um, an MRI as resolutions of you know 256 by 256 or 128 by 128 matrices, right? And then, um, and if you the average body, you know, is uh, you know like a brain is something like around 20 centimeters. So the spatial resolution of a 256 squared matrix at a 20 centimeter field of view is something that is sub millimeter. Right, but all of it depends, and it's all inter, it's all related to the amount of spins that you have within that voxel. So you have a pixel is is a one plane divided into x uh, say x number of coordinates. So if you have 20 centimeters on each axis, and you have 256 points on each axis, you have um, 256 times 256 pixels in that matrix. Um, you can make it simple, like four by four. Um, then if you are selecting a slab or a, a slice, then the third dimension is, makes it a cubic element, and that's a voxel. So it's a volume element rather than a, uh, a single element in the plane. The signal to noise, so the spatial resolution is related directly into the amount of signal, which is directly related to the number of protons that you have within a voxel. And all of MR is based on signal to noise, right? Because we have, we're going back to our original experiment, you have your free induction decay, but you need to amplify that signal. And then anytime you amplify the signal, you amplify noise. So, and then the, the signal is directly related to the number of the magnetization vector, which is directly related to the number of protons that are parallel and antiparallel. All of MR has this interplay between temporal and spatial resolution and um, field of view. So I could get sub, you know, I could get micron or almost, uh, you know, one or two micron spatial resolution. It would just take me a long time to acquire that image with an adequate signal to noise to see anything you want to make an imaging experiment that is in a reasonable amount of time that gives you all of the information that's relevant for the, for the diagnosis that you're requesting, but you also have a human being that you can't leave in there in the magnet forever. We have a patient, the patient has to stay in the magnet for no longer than a half an hour or 45 minutes. We need to get all of the specific pieces of information to answer the question that the physician who's requesting the scan is asking. MR has artifacts that um, occur from metal. So if I have a hip transplant, then uh, that would produce um, a lack of magnetization, kind of sort of in a, almost in a sphere around the transplant. And I can't get that magnetization back because I can't get the spins to become coherent around that metal transplant. You, there are many things that you, you can't get around that. Um, MRI, because of the means by which you actually have to encode spatial information, takes time. And because it takes time and you need all of the spins to be exactly in the same place, so it's very unfriendly towards motion. So imaging the upper abdomen, which moves with respiration, is challenging. And you essentially synchronize the acquisition to someone's respiration, either intrinsically based on the pulse sequence itself or by respiratory bellows that move with patient's respiration. 
So you have motion artifact, you have flow artifacts that occur that are as a result of pulsating flow within vessels. You can limit that by saturating the spins that are in the flowing vessels above and below the region of interest.